We're now going to take another look at Lev Shestov's classic early work, All Things Are Possible. In an earlier video, I talked about some of the key themes. I gave a sort of introduction to what Shestov was doing in this, this aphoristic work, which is a number of different very short essays and passages strung together, some of them only a few lines, some of them several pages long. And this time I want to focus on what we can call his critique of philosophy. Not of philosophy as such in every case across the board, but a critique of philosophy as it's found in modern Western and also of, of the rush of his time culture. Um, why do I want to focus on this? Because this is a, a set of threads that run through the entire work. There are many other important themes, so any sort of assemblage of them is going to be sort of a, an arbitrary kind of set of cuts across Shestov's work. But I think it's, it's worth keeping in mind, he is a critic of several philosophers in, in particular, Kant especially, um, but also some of the thinkers that we would think of as utilitarianism in a very broad sense, positivism, really anybody who's doing metaphysics in its traditional sense, particularly in its post-Kantian sense, and he's, he's focusing on, on examining what these people are doing and contrasting them against individuals like, say, Dostoevsky or Nietzsche, people that we'll come to call existentialists later, and also people like um, Shakespeare. He's contrasting them because there's something that gets lost in, in the process. So I want to focus on two longer passages in the second part of the work to sort of get us started, and, and you'll see why I'm picking these out. He's diagnosing the prob problematic situation of his time, which I think is still the problematic situation of our own time. So here's how the passages run, and I'll, I'll introduce commentary from time to time. He says, the ancients were right. Not in vain is our earth called a veil of tears and sorrow. And once questions are started, it's impossible and unseemly to hurry the answers, still less to anticipate the questions. The situation is so palpably absurd that only with the intention of getting rid of the question at any cost will one strive for a sensible answer. The answer must be absurd. If you don't want it, don't question there's much more to be said about that, but I want to pause for a moment. So, we're struck by the absurdity of things, and we, we question the universe, ourselves, God, other people, society, pick whatever you, you like as, as the interlocutor for our questions. We question, we, we say, this doesn't make sense. And if the question itself is, in certain respects, absurd in response to absurdity, we shouldn't be surprised if the answers quite often turn out to be, in the broad sense, also absurd, Shestov thinks. We're not looking for, although this is the trap that, that we always fall into, we're not looking for questions that will be valid, or answers that will be valid for every being at every time, you know, in sort of a conscient sense, all rational beings as such. What we're looking for are answers that can satisfy us. And that doesn't mean that we just pick whatever we like. You know, we choose whatever is going to satisfy our, our interests or our sort of superficial demands. But we can't approach questions and the process of answering them with the preconception that when we find an answer, it will apply to everybody equally. So he goes on. He says, But if you must question then be ready beforehand to reconcile yourself with something like solipsism or modern realism. Thought is at a dilemma, and dare not take the leap to get out. We laugh at philosophy and as long as possible avoid evil. But nearly all men feel the intolerable cramp of such a situation, and each at his risk ventures to swim to shore on some more or less witty theory. We, we pick different ways of understanding things. All of us have a philosophy that we pick, we endorse, we, we try to live out, whether we call it a philosophy or not. And we do so 
because we need something to answer these, these questions about what, what, what the hell am I doing here? What is life about? What is the good? What is the bad? How should I behave? How can I judge you know, whether I'm actually living well? Uh, what should my neighbor over there be doing and what should I be doing with him? And you know, we, these just spiral out of, out of control, these, these questions. And so we, we need some sort of systematic way to, to make sense out of them. And we do find these. And he says, a few courageous ones speak the truth, but they're neither understood nor respected. When a man's words show the depth of the pain through which he has passed, he is not indeed condemned, but the world begins to talk of his tragic state of soul and to take out a mournful look fitting to the occasion. And they misunderstand what, what things are about, what the, the thinker is trying to do. If we skip down a little bit, he says, For thousands of years, man has sought to solve the great mystery of life through a God conception. Now remember, Shestov is a religious thinker, but he's rejecting the kind of God conception that we're, we're seeing here. In, in many respects, it's very Augustinian, this notion that our notion of God quite often is a projection of our own wishes, desires, imaginations, and that's not adequate to the actual... God that's out there. As a matter of fact, it becomes an idol that we, we end up chaining ourselves to rather than having a connection to the real God. So he says, a God conception with theodicy and metaphysical theories is a result, both of which deny the possibility of a mystery. This is a key idea. For Shestov, life is mysterious. Life is shot through with things that not only don't we know, but we don't even know what we don't know in them. And as we probe into them, we discover there's, there's depths below depths below depths. And we can probe into them, but we can't completely illuminate them. There are things that do remain and have to remain mysterious. So there are mysteries. Theodicy and metaphysics, in their classical sense, try to explain away the mysteries, including the mystery of, of, of evil. That's what theodicy is about. So he says, Theodicy has long ago wearied us. The mechanistic theories which contend that there is nothing special in life, that its appearance and disappearance depend on the same laws as those of the conservation of energy and the indestructibility of matter, these look more plausible at first sight, but people don't take to them. Interestingly, we're going through the same thing in our own time, with you know people making wild claims that go far beyond the realms of actual science, saying, yes, we can fully understand everything, everything through the mechanisms, through the theories, through the, the, what it makes available of science and, and technology, whether it be our moral life, whether it be whether God could possibly exist or not, whether it be um, does free will exist. And, and you notice that no matter how many times it's reported to us that, well, science has solved these problems, and there's a new book out here who says, or the author of whom says, I've actually proven that God can't exist, or God must exist, or there's something in our genes, or there's nothing in our genes. People treat it as, as if this is just plausible, an entertaining story that maybe they'll pick up or maybe they won't. They were doing that in Shestov's time as well. Like he says, um, no theory can survive man's reluctance to believe in it. In a word, good has not justified the expectations placed on it. Reason has done no better. So overwrought mankind turned from its old idols and enthroned madness and evil. We, we find a shift, and this is taking place you know, around the turn of the century in the last century, uh, towards decadence, towards looking at the dark side of, of human beings. And then, you know, terrible things showed up on the scene in a way that nobody in, in Europe could, could ignore through, you know, the First World War and then, you know, the rise of totalitarianism of both left and right and the Second World War, genocide, all those sorts of things made it, made it impossible for a while to look away from, from that. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we uh, turn away from our old idols and throw madness and evil. And then he says, um, Who knows 
what our children are going to do. It may be that our children will take fright at the task we've undertaken and call us squandering parents and will set themselves again to heaping up treasures, spiritual and material. Again, they will believe in ideals, progress, and such like. For my own part, I hardly have any doubt of it. Shestov thinks that after every sort of crash, a spiritual crash, and explorations of, of you know, what is going on, um, a new generation will arise that has to, to create, again, out of whatever has been ruined, make sense of it, and then these old ideals, you know, like science, logic, morality, are going to come back on the scene. And he says, um, solipsism and the cult of groundlessness are not lasting, and most of all, they're not to be handed down. The final triumph in life, as with old comedies, rests with goodness and, and common sense. History has known many epochs like ours. This is something really interesting that he's saying. Many people want to think that modernity is something totally special, that there's a spiritual crisis that takes place in modernity that's unlike any others, incomparable to them, and therefore we must speak of, say, the postmodern, or, you know, nihilism is showing up on the scene fully in modernity. Shestov doesn't think so. Shestov thinks that that's always right around the corner, and that certain epochs have been characterized by this. And, and there he's, you know, really in agreement with somebody like Nietzsche. I mean, when Nietzsche is criticizing the Socratic and the Alexandrine in his, his uh, Birth of Tragedy, he's talking about something like very akin to modern nihilism. We can see this happening, not only you know, in certain epochs in history, but in certain locations. A culture loses its, its force, its conception, and begins to collapse in upon itself. Why? Not because of economic problems alone, but because of a loss of meaning. This is what he's talking about here. Um, there's another passage, another long passage, that sort of sets the scene as well. Uh, this is section 16 out of the, the second part. He says, Man comes to the past where all experience seems exhausted. Wherever he go, wherever, whatever he see, all is old and wearyingly familiar. This is, this is an experience that we, we do encounter once we reach a certain stage. Younger people often act as if this is the case, but they don't really know that, that that's the case yet. He says, most people explain this by saying they really know everything, and from what they have experienced, they can infer all experience. This phase of the exhaustion, exhaustion of life usually comes to a man between 35 and 40. Not seeing anything new, the individual assumes he is completely matured and has the right to judge of everything. Now, this is exactly what Shestov is criticizing in a nutshell. This notion that, well... From this portion that I've seen, I have exhausted all the possibilities, and I can extrapolate to everything else and say it's all going to be more or less like this. I have, I have figured out what the essential shapes of reality, both inward and outward, can possibly be, and now I can actually go on to make sense of it all. But you notice when, when it's made sense of, it's, it's, it doesn't really matter very much. So he says... The fact of spiritual stagnation should not be made the ground for judging all life's possibilities from known possibilities. On the contrary, this should spur us to something new. Such that stagnation should prove that however rich and multifarious the past may have been, it has not exhausted a tittle of the whole possibilities. From what has been, it is impossible to infer what will be. It is equally impossible, and this is what Shestov really wants to stress to us, to infer what cannot be. It is impossible to have something like a transcendental critique of all possibilities and say, this is ruled out, this is ruled in. Why? Because we human beings are not that sort of creature. Again, he talks about the, the culture of his time. We are bored, stiff with regularity and sequence. Confess it, you also, you men of science. 
At the mere thought of that, however we may think, we can get no further than the acknowledgement of the old regularity and invincible disgust to any kind of mental work overcomes us. To discover another law, still another, when already we have far more than we can do with. Surely, if there is any will to think left in us, it is established in the supposition that the mind cannot and must not have any bounds. Shestoff is about liberation. Shestoff is about freedom for the human being. Because what is bound the human being is only other human beings and the human being, him or herself, placing themselves within the grip of some sort of assumed mechanism, some sort of imagined carapace, you might say, or armature, in which they, they believe that they must remain. Nothing actually binds us within there by necessity. Necessity itself is an illusion, according to, to Shestov. So he says, The theory of knowledge which is based on the history of knowledge and on very few doubtful assumptions, is only a piece of property belonging to a certain caste. It has nothing to do with us others. What a mad impatience seizes us at times when we realize that we shall never fathom the great mystery. Every individual in the world must have felt at one time the mad desire to unriddle the universe. Even the stodgy philosophers who invented the theory of knowledge, like Kant, have at times made surreptitious sorties hoping to open a path to the unknown in spite of their own fat, senseless books that demonstrate the advantages of scientific knowledge. Man either lives in continuous experience or he frees himself from conclusions imposed by limited experience. Again, we see the same theme coming up over and over again. Shestov is, is posing us with uh, a dilemma. Necessity versus freedom. He talks about, at one point in here, he's got this brilliant phrase. He calls morality, science, and logic. And any philosophy that is, is operating according to, to those, those police agents. And, and think about what policing does. Policing enforces a kind of order. And why does it actually work? Because of the will of the police. Because of the will of those directing them. Because of the wills of those who allow themselves to be coerced. Who see the police coming and say, Ah, I'd better knock off what I'm doing because, you know, it's not going to accord with, with these things and I don't want them to lock me up, to give me a citation, to even verbally warn me, to call my attention, call uh, me uh, to my neighbor's attention as being subversive, as being deviant, as, as not fitting in. Um, policing is really, and here Shestov is, you know, sort of working off of Nietzsche and going all the way to anticipating somebody like Foucault or Deleuze, which is a brilliant thinker. Um, is, is realizing that a lot of what we call culture, including intellectual culture, including philosophy, is really a kind of policing. And he wants to try to break out of that, to break free of that. Um, another set of passages, now we're going to the, the uh, first part. One of the passages that's particularly relevant to understanding why Shestov is criticizing certain ways of doing philosophy, certain, certain congealed or sedimented pressures placed upon us when we start to think in modern culture. Uh, we can find, for example, in, in this passage, uh, number 118 in the first part, he says, um, he's criticizing the, the sort of you know, German uh, idealistic post-Kantian philosophy. He says, the a priori of contemporary thought convinces more and more that Nietzsche's instinct was not, all, not at all at fault. The root of all our philosophies lies not in our objective observations, but in the demands of our own heart, in the subjective moral will. And he then says, science cannot be uprooted unless we, we destroy morality, in part because morality consists in an imposition of, upon ourselves of our own will, 
Uh, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But I want to now move to another passage where he's talking about something similar, passage 101 in the first part. He says, Every philosophic world conception starts from some or other solution of the general problem of human existence and proceeds from this to direct the course of human life in some particular direction or another. Every time that we're doing philosophy, we are, we are oriented ultimately, whether we admit this to ourselves or not, in an existential way. We're, we're doing the kind of philosophy that we're doing, even if it's the stupidest, most stultifyingly boring stuff in the world. And there's a lot of boring philosophy out there, trust me. Um, I had to study some of that in, as an undergraduate and in graduate school. When we're doing that, when we're preoccupying ourselves with that, when we're thinking about that, we are choosing for ourselves not only what sort of vocabulary, concepts, terminology, mechanisms we're going to use to understand things, but what we're actually going to pay attention to, what matters for us. And then as we, we, we build it, as we apply it, as we, even if we're just complete doctrinaire, lockstep, you know, uh, schematizers, we are still engaged in, in applying it. And that's our, our will at work. What's going on there? He says, here's the fundamental problem. We have neither the power nor the data for the solution of general problems, and consequently all our moral deductions are arbitrary. They only witness to one of two things, he says. Moral, the, or the, not moral uh, deductions, prejudices if we are naturally timid, or our propensities and tastes if we're self-confident. What does he mean there? Well, prejudices. We often think of prejudice as meaning something that an individual person has and it's their own sort of stubbornness that they're stuck in. But no, you know what a prejudice really is? is something inherited from somebody else that we've taken on and said, yes, that must be true. I have to, I have to live according to it. You know, if we're talking about racial prejudice, for example, a, a child doesn't become racist on their own. They become racist by hearing other people say, well, you know, that group of people there, don't, don't associate with them. They're dirty and, and you know, unclean and, and uh, they, you know, they're predatory or lazy or pick whatever you like. And then if they're timid, they don't kick against that, and they don't. Uh, they just sort of accept it. They don't. They don't refute it within their, themselves or their experience, and then it becomes a lens which they use. Well, the same thing happens with philosophy. Somebody goes to a, a you know philosophy department, and it's all analytic philosophers. Or somebody goes and it's all continental philosophers. Or you know back in Shestov's day, you could have gone and it wouldn't have been analytic or, or continental because they weren't really on the scene at that time. It might have been the, you know the Hegel's got it all right, or Kant's got it all right, or we're all empiricists here, or we're all positivists, not not logical positivists later on, but the Comtean sort of or Spencerian kind of positivists. But why would you take that on? Why would you assume that they actually have it right? Well, some people are naturally timid. They are more follower types. Um, on the other hand, our propensities and tastes if we're self-confident. But is this a basis for actually philosophizing, not just for oneself, but for, for everybody? So to keep up prejudice is a miserable, unworthy business. So let's, let's not, you know, expect that. Um, and, you know, any other sort of way of understanding it. It's going to be based in our subjective choices, our wills. Let's not pretend like that actually applies to everybody either. Does that mean that we have to actually give up on philosophy though? You know, traditionally, think about somebody like Kant, for example. If it's not valid for all rational beings, it's, and this is just paraphrasing, this is not what he said, it's all crap. It's worthless. Well, that, that's Kant's view of philosophy. That's not everybody's view of philosophy. And, and why the hell would we think that we have to follow Kant's view of philosophy? Do we just hear the words and they're automatically convincing us? The, the history of philosophy, of metaphysics up until now, has just been a history of error. Well, how does he know that? Has he actually plumbed the depths of Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, you know? Uh, then going through, you know, Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas. If you read Kant, he actually seems to know something about these people, but aren't you kind of a sucker if you just accept his word for it? 
The same thing could be said about, in our own time, analytic philosophy or continental philosophy of all the different stripes. Why automatically assume that Nietzsche got things right? Why assume that, you know, philosophy is fundamentally about argument? And that reading the history of philosophy doesn't, doesn't really prepare one for, for anything important? Why assume that you have to put on the, the hermeneutics of, of suspicion? Why assume that phenomenology is the way to go? One takes these on, and that is because one chooses to, and then disguises from oneself the fact that one is doing that. And, and you could say, well, hey, Shestoff, why should I listen to your stuff then? And Shestoff would say, perfectly right. But I'm not claiming that what I'm doing counts for everybody or has to be taken as the one philosophy. As a matter of fact, what I'm advocating is something quite different. I'm advocating, he says, um, let's try to, to you know, come to an understanding and allow there to be different philosophies out there. Um, let's permit this to, to, to be the, the case. He, uh, he has a few other things that are, are worth looking at as well. Uh, with respect to this. Um, he says, the possibilities which open up before mankind are sufficiently limited in our lives. It's impossible to see everything, impossible to know everything, impossible to rise too high above the earth, impossible to penetrate too deeply down. What has been is hidden away. What will be we cannot anticipate. And we know for certain we shall never grow wings. Regularity, immutably regular succession of phenomena puts a term to our efforts, drives us into a narrow, regular, hard-beaten road of everyday life. But even on this road, we may wander from side to side. We can deviate from it. He says, Another life is conceivable. Life in which the word disaster does not exist where responsibility for one's actions at least has not such a deadly and accidental weight, and on, where on the other hand there is no regularity, but rather an infinite number of possibilities. That is what Shestov is trying to, to get at. And these are the sorts of things that Shestov thinks we have to take as our guides for, for philosophy, not just books, not just consistency, we have to actually pay attention to our experience, and we have to treat our experience with the weight that it deserves. We, you know, if we're going to say, well, I need to go to experience, don't pretend like your experience is the definitive experience. But do look at your experience. Rely upon the imagination. Don't take for granted Kant or Nietzsche or Heidegger or A.J. Ayer or pick whoever you like you know, um, Russell or Kripke or anybody telling you that this is what can be thought, this is what's meaningful, and everything outside of that is, is nonsense or worthless or can't be relied upon. Don't even accept people who are skeptics like Hume saying, no, you, you, can't, you can't believe this. Perhaps Hume is actually wrong about some things. Experiment. Put things to the test. Try them out. You know, I, I said in a previous video that Shestoff is a radical empiricist, and, and that's sort of along the same lines as William James. James considered his form of pragmatism to be a kind of empiricism that required that you actually make a leap, try things out, and then you'll find out what's on the other side. If you just try to make deductions about it you know, beforehand, well, of course you'll never discover anything interesting, because you didn't actually try anything. If you want to see whether there's anything to religion, go to church. Not just once. That's not an experiment. Actually try something out. If you want to see whether the Stoics were on to anything about this you know, self-denial leading to greater freedom, try it out. Do, it, do Epictetus' experiment. Or take a sip of water and spit it out when you're really thirsty. And then see what that happens, see what happens because of that, and do it maybe 30 times, 30 days in a row. Um, if you want to see whether Kant could actually give you guidelines that could make sense out of your life, read the Kant, try to apply it. We also have to take a, you know, a guidepost from, from our suffering and the suffering of others. We have to pay attention to what goes on. Um, we have to explore things. We have to 
He says that metaphysics ought to be driven by passion, not just by, by intellect alone. Um, so, Shestov is going to be criticizing a number of different developments within contemporary philosophy of his own time, which are really quite strong in, a, in our, our own time, if we change the wording around a little bit and make sense of it. He's going to say that there is a strong thread, current, however you want to put it, of utilitarianism running throughout the, the history of thought, and particularly in modern life, not because modern people are necessarily different, but because we, we communicate with each other more, and we, we, when we call things into question, our, our justification for them quite often in the end is, well, this is what works, you know, and by what works we don't just mean pragmatism, we mean this is what turns out best for the majority of people, so it must be, it must be right. We make a lot of appeals to, to utilitarian kind of thinking, um, whether we're utilitarians or not. He's also seeing that there's, you know, this, this strong moralizing tendency within modern thought, within modern culture, modern life. Not one that was invented, of course, in modernity, but, you know, it, it's, it's come through. And even the postmoderns, even the people who are, you know, radical and, and you know, going to make the world better or are totally pessimistic about the, the possibility of the world, very often, they're quite moralistic. You can, you can find these sort of trends in them as well. And what is he really concerned with? He's concerned with an appeal to the crowd. This is where you know, his existentialism is really coming through. He's concerned with this putting things up to, they're putting their value up to the opinions, the appreciation of the many. And there's so many things that are worthwhile that have value. And the many are a terrible guide to that. As a matter of fact, even the one, unless the one is properly cultivated or the right things happen to align, may not see the value in, in some things. Another thing that he's really critical of is, is what he's calling positivism. And oftentimes in this work, it's actually going to be counterposed to metaphysics. Um, positivism was a movement in philosophy and in culture, uh, more, more broadly, that said that we must focus only on positive questions to which we can give positive answers. We must confine ourselves to the realm of the observable, of facts. We must not engage in metaphysics or let alone in theology, in, in mysticism, to use a, a word that Bertrand Russell loved to use and totally misused because what he calls, what he, you know, uh, called mysticism is very detached from genuine mysticism, which is about mysteries. Um, what he meant was mystification. You know, just having sort of vague sentiments about things. We're going to get rid of all that. We're going to stick to what we, what we know. And you can be a positivist not only in terms of philosophy, um, but you can be a positivist in terms of science. If positivism is really in some ways kind of a worship of science. It says, you know, the, the methods of science are going to be the things to solve everything. Although usually it doesn't have a very clear conception of exactly what science consists in, or if you look at the positivist theories that have been espoused, their notions of science have been kind of modified <laughs> over time. And uh, some of their notions actually turned out to be kind of, kind of crazy. If you look at what Comte actually believed, you know, coming up with a whole church of science. Um, but it you know, reveals what, what he was really about. Um, you can have a positivistic sort of viewpoint outside of the field of sciences, the sciences, and outside of, you know, the big questions. You can do so in terms of commerce. You can do so in terms of um, consumerism. You can do so through politics. You can do so in a lot of different ways. What we ought to be reading, what we shouldn't be reading. In a certain way, Positivism isn't empirical enough. 
it pretends that it's totally empirical, it's getting rid of all this metaphysical nonsense, but it constrains the realm of experience far too much. Metaphysics means a couple different things for Shestov. And he's using the term in, in a, a very general sense, but he's also using it in, in specific senses. He's really a strong critic of armchair metaphysicians who kind of, you know, construct imaginary universes and systems and philosophies out of their head and on the basis of very little experience, going far beyond the realm of, of experience. Um, and that's something that Kant was critical of. That's something that, you know, other people have been, been critical of as well. Um, Shestov thinks that those people are actually kind of creating fables. So the positivists are in a certain sense right about that, that kind of behavior. He's also criticizing the kind of metaphysics that, say, Kant was doing, where you're trying to, through a transcendental critique, that is through sort of an examination on the basis of reason alone, of all the possibilities and impossibilities of things and what those in turn require um, that are going to give you, you know, yield you universal laws or at least show you the limits beyond which you can't really say anything. Shestov is extremely critical of that sort of thing as well. In part because he thinks, really, when it comes down to this, they're doing the same sort of thing. They're just claiming to have greater rigor. They're claiming that, you know, logic constrains them to understanding things this way. But really, that, that's not the case at all. It's quite possible to conceive the imagination of all sorts of other possibilities that you can, in fact, work out and, and think out in philosophical ways. Because guess what? People have done it. And saying that, well, you know, the previous stuff just doesn't fit into my transcendental system that's not really showing that those other ways of thinking about things aren't really on to anything. That's showing that they can't fit into your system, what it is that you're willing, what you want philosophy to look like. And what a lot of people probably have bought into and said, yeah, I want philosophy to look like that too, or it must look like that. I can only accept this sort of thing because that's what the culture of my time is telling me. Shestov is criticizing all of these, like I pointed out before, as being sort of, you know, forms of policing. For ways in which we allow ourselves to be taken in and think that we are, see there's a seductiveness to this. We, we get to feel like we're in the know. We, we've got the system out there. We have got the categories, the ironclad laws that must govern everything. Why does that matter to us? Because we want to have it. We want to be the ones surveying those things from on top. There's a problem, though. As soon as we do that, we wind up below them. And they become the dictators that tell us exactly what we can and can't do. And when we establish these sort of, you know, when we use a Weberian phrase, iron cages of rationality, they're not liberating. They may liberate, liberate us from previous systems, previous prejudices, you know, historical forms of existence that we want to leave behind, but they also constrain us as well. So now, let's look at some of the things that he has to say about these specifically. Let's begin with Shestov's best criticism, as far as I can see it, of somebody who, who actually was a great metaphysician, Kant. He says, ever since Kant succeeded in convincing the learned that the world of phenomenon is quite other than the world of true reality, and that even our own existence is not our real existence, but only the visible manifestation of a mysterious unknown substance, philosophy has been stuck in a new rut, and cannot move a single millimeter out of the track laid by the great Königsbergian. Backwards or forward it can go, but necessarily in the Kantian rut. For how can you get out of the counterposing of the phenomenon against the thing in itself? And he goes on, and he says, um, Surely the contraposition between the world of phenomena and the thing in itself is an invention of, and what metaphysics does, the reasoning mind. As is the theory of knowledge deduced from this contraposing. Wherefore the freedom-loving spirit could reject it in the very beginning, and 
there you go. He says, we know very well that if it gets hold of the tip of, of your ear, he's talking about the devil, but he's also talking about metaphysics, it will carry off your whole body. So it is with reason. Grant it one single assumption, admit just one proposition, and finita la com comedia. The, the, the play is over. You are in the toils. Metaphysics, he says, cannot exist side by side with reason. And this is very interesting. Because now a dialectical transformation takes place here. He says, metaphysics cannot exist side by side with reason. Everything metaphysical is actually absurd. Everything reasonable is positive, experiential, within the realm of what we no. So he says, so we come upon a dilemma. The fundamental predicate of metaphysics is absurdity, and yet surely many positive assertions can lay legitimate claim to that self-same highly respectable predicate. There's absurdity on both sides. What then? Is there a means of distinguishing a metaphysical absurdity from a perfectly ordinary one? A little bit later, he says, all services rendered by reason must be paid for sooner or later at the exorbitant price of self-renunciation. We're all, if we want to look at this in a Nietzschean way, we're all sort of caught up as ascetics if we want to either be positivists or we want to be metaphysicians. And if we think that these are the only alternatives, that itself is a mistaken viewpoint according to, to Shostov. Kant placed us in there, and now we're kind of stuck with it. He says, the only way to guard against positivism, granting, of course, that positivism no longer attracts your sympathies, is to cease to fear any absurdities, whether rational or metaphysical, and systematically to reject all the services of reason. That sounds quite crazy, doesn't it? I'm going to just reject all the services of reason. He says, such behavior has been known in philosophy, and I make bold to recommend it. Credo quia absurdum comes from the Middle Ages. Modern instances are Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. Both present noble examples of indifference to logic and common sense. Particularly Schopenhauer, who, a Kantian, even in the name of Kant, made such daring sallies against reason, driving her into confusion and shame. What is going on? Um, he's criticizing Kant, he's criticizing metaphysics in, in you know, the classical sense, he's criticizing positivism as a reaction against metaphysics that really smuggles in its own, its own metaphysics. And all of this is on the basis of saying that these are choices that people make. These are not systems that impose themselves upon us out of necessity. They are ways in which we impose necessity upon ourselves or allow other people to impose necessity upon us. You know, it's really, if you think about it, just take Kant for one example, but you could come up with innumerable other ones. Why should I feel bound to observe some limits or even the ways of conceiving things that some guy in Königsberg, even if he was a swell guy and you know had a lot of friends and wrote some some cool books, why would I necessarily think that I have to fit my conceptions into his framework? Somewhere along the line, I've ended up, if I'm you know the conscient, I've ended up accepting that this guy had it right. Probably what I've accepted is, my teacher has it right, and my teacher really likes Kant, or, you know, the people who are published or, or, or in the, you know, in the know or the intelligentsia have it right, and they accept this guy, and, and they think that he's got it right, so I'd better do it myself. I'd better impose it. I'd better internalize it within my own sphere of freedom and action and imagination and thought, and I'd better live my life out as if this, this stuff is actually true. Now, you know... If you were going to say that about some dogma like, um, you know, Stalinist communism, we would all look at that and say, geez, that's, that's crazy. That's the sort of stuff that, you know, um, 1984 is made of. But, you know, when it's a philosopher who seems much more mild, and it's just saying, look, if you, if, you, if you want to get things right, here's how you have to do them. 
somehow we accept it. And if, if Kant isn't your, your bag for that, perhaps it's Hume, or perhaps it's Russell, or perhaps it's Quine, or perhaps it's Nietzsche, or perhaps it's, you know, over and over again, people are buying into these, these positivist frameworks or metaphysics. Um, here's some other things that, that Shestov has to say about doing metaphysics that are, that are quite interesting, actually. He says, the, this is uh, section 23 in, in uh, the first part. The first assumption of all metaphysics is that by dialectical development of any concept, a whole system can be evolved. What luck! <laughs> you can start out with almost nothing and manufacture a whole system. Of course, the initial concept, the a priori, is generally unsound. There's the problem. So there's no need to mention the deductions. But since it's very difficult in the realm of abstract thought to distinguish a lie from truth, Metaphysical systems often have a very convincing appearance. The chief defect only appears incidentally when the taste for dialectical play becomes blunted in man uh, so that he realizes the uselessness of philosophical systems. And this is, you know, just a brilliant way to put it. Um, so he says, to him who has no taste for dialectics, metaphysics can prove nothing either. Therefore, those who are interested in the success of metaphysics must always encourage the opinion that a taste for dialectics is a high distinction in a man proving the loftiness of his soul. Brilliant thing to say. You know, where metaphysics usually begins is with some sort of arbitrary, ultimately personal, choice on the part of the metaphysician, which doesn't really hold for everybody, and somewhere along the line, we forget that, and, and people start saying, yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. And sooner or later, it becomes this, this trap of necessity, um, which is one of the things Shestov is so keen to say that doesn't really exist, doesn't really apply. The realm of the necessary is, to, to some extent, an illusion, even in the lower realm, and as applying to the whole, is completely illusory. That's what Shestov wants, to, wants us to realize. Um, this is actually a good point to make a detour into his discussions of, of logic and necessity. He says, this is section 21, The habit of logical thinking kills imagination. Man is convinced the only way to truth is through logic and that any departure from this way leads to error and absurdity. It doesn't necessarily need to mean formal logic, the kind of things that we learn in philosophy classes. Something that has structure, that is demanded to have consistency, um, that's what he means by logic. The nearer, he says, we approach to ultimate questions of existence in our departure from logicality, the more deadly becomes the state of error we fall into. The Ariadne ball has become all unwound long ago. That's the, the ball of, of thread by which uh, Theseus was able to find his way out of the, the labyrinth after he kills the, the Minotaur, because Ariadne gives it to him. And man is at the end of the tether, but he does not know. He holds the end of the thread firmly and marks time with energy on the same spot, imagining his progress and little realizing the ridiculous situation into which he has fallen. How should he realize, considering the innumerable precautions he has taken to prevent himself from losing the logical way? Um, he says, philosophy must have nothing in common with logic. This is an extreme stance, isn't it? Philosophy is an art which, breaks, which aims at breaking the logical continuity of argument and bringing man out onto the shoreless sea of imagination, the fantastic tides where everything is equally possible and impossible. And he says, certainly it's difficult, given sedentary habits of life, to be a good philosopher. Logic gives us the, the appearance of necessity. But we, we, again, you impose this upon ourselves. Um, I find another particularly important discussion of that. Um, a little bit later, this is section 106, he says, To discard logic as an instrument, as a means or aid for acquiring knowledge, would be extravagant. So, actually, it's a bit more tempered. He's saying, look, in... in the big questions, the things that really are at the bottom of, 
of what concerns us, to find our general principles that we're going to operate by, logic is actually going to get in our way. But, you know, for certain things, the day-to-day, -day, a means or aid for acquiring knowledge, we don't need to get rid of it. Why should we? For the sake of consequentialism, that is, for logic's very self, is logic really the sort of thing that can say to us, look, either you accept me across the board or you don't accept me at all. Well, why would we accept that on the part of logic? Why can't we turn it into what it's supposed to be, which is merely a tool? It's not supposed to rule over us. It's not supposed to determine everything from, from the top down of whatever can be or cannot be and how everything is connected with everything else. It's merely a tool. Aristotle called it the organon. That was what logic was originally. Or, you know, the logike uh, means the rational or, or that which is coming through, through speech. Later philosophers turned it into this, this necessity. He says, um, against this one must fight, even if he has against himself all the authorities of thought, beginning with Aristotle. Um, A little bit later, he's talking about the law of identity, A equals A. They say logic does not need this postulate and could easily develop it by deduction. I think not. I think that we do have to postulate it, he's saying. I think that we do, actually, if we want logic to work, we have to sort of feed some things into the machine to begin with. On the contrary, in my opinion, logic could not exist without this premise. But where is this thing, a thing is equal to what it is, a thing is what it is, where is this actually coming from? Is this something deduced from other logical laws, axioms? No, this is coming from experience. It says, it has a purely empirical origin. In the realm of fact, A is always more or less equal to A, but it, it could be otherwise. That which now equals A would successively equal B and then C and so on. A stone at present remains long enough a stone, a plant, a plant, an animal, an animal. But there's nothing unthinkable about the stone turning into a plant. Now, science, positivism will tell us that can't possibly be the case. We've observed all these plants and we've never seen anything like that. We've observed all these stones. We've never seen anything like that. Um, science has, has shown that that can't be the case, even though science never actually shows that, that you know, something is absolutely, conclusively, deductively the case, unless we're talking about mathematics, right? Um, metaphysics on its turns can say that's not compatible with our starting points from which we've spun out this great gigantic system well so much the worse for them Shostov would say let's look at a few more passages about, about metaphysics and necessity and then we will uh, talk about morality and uh, utilitarianism um, he says in um, the second part Section, uh, here we go, 39. And a long uh, set of passages where he's criticizing um, what's been going on with, with, uh, with Kant. He says, a priori synthetic judgments. Kant, as we know, found in mathematics and the natural sciences a priori synthetic judgments. Was he right or wrong? Are the judgments he indicated a priori or a posteriori? Anyhow, one thing is certain. They're not accepted as absolutely, but only as relatively indisputable. In metaphysics, where the only curious and important truths are, are hidden, the case is different. Kant was compelled to admit that just where metaphysics begins, the capacity of our human reason to judge a priori ends. But since we can't dispense with metaphysical judgments, he proposed to substitute for them postulates. But are, are postulates really any, any different? No. And he goes on a little bit more, he says, um, Men are greedy. They want to learn much and get their knowledge cheap. So they think that every truth they've paid for with experience and loss of energy entitles them to a few more truths gratis. Or in philosophical language, a priori, by deduction. They are not ashamed to speculate with a gift that's been given them. Instead of looking, listening, touching, seeking, they want to infer and conclude. But nothing comes of their conclusions save metaphysical systems and empty prattle. It's surely time, Shostov says, 
to give up conclusions and get at truth a posteriori, through experience, as did Shakespeare, Goethe, Dostoevsky. That is, every time you want to know anything, go and look and find out. And if one is lazy or horrified at a new experiment, let him train himself to look on ultimate questions with indifference, as the positivists do. In a certain way, positivism is a restriction of our capacities so that we don't really experience anything momentous. He also uh, goes on and, and uh, here we go. Um, this is in section one. Ah, here we are. He says, um, from a German introduction to philosophy, we shall maintain the opinion that metaphysics as the crown of the particular sciences is possible and desirable, and that to it falls the task intermediate between theory and practice, experiment and anticipation, mind and feeling, the task of weighing probabilities, balancing arguments, and reconciling differences. And so he says, this is Shestov. Oh, okay, so metaphysics is weighing pro probabilities. So further than probable conclusions, it cannot go. The, why did metaphysicians then pretend to universal and obligatory established in eternal judgments? They go beyond themselves. In the domain of metaphysics, there cannot and must be any established beliefs. It's reasonable to speak of eternal hesitation and temporality of thought. Um, there is one other thing I want to hit on, too, with respect to, to positivism per se. He says, um, this is in this long section, he says, um, the section 44, experience and science in the second part, science is useful, but she need not pretend to truth. She cannot know what truth is, she can only accumulate universal laws. To that he might have added, and, and notations, not experiences, notations about phenomena. Whereas there are, and always have been, non-scientific ways of searching for the truth, ways which lead, if not to the innermost secrets, yet at least to the threshold. These roads, however, we've let fall into ruin while we followed our modern methodologies, so we dare not even think of them. And here he says something really interesting. He's not actually advocating astrology or anything like that, but he says, what gives us the right to assert that astrologers, alchemists, diviners, sorcerers who pass their long nights alone with their thoughts, wasted their time in vain. Why, why are we so convinced of that? Does anybody actually know anything about that? Have they actually read, you know, Parcellus and seen what he was actually saying? Did he actually have any interesting thoughts? He might have been, you know, completely wrong about the nature of chemistry. But is that all that was going on there? He says, um, Whence such surety? What does it mean? How do we know that none of these things matter? He says, the support of the mob is a necessary condition of the existence of modern philosophy. And it's knights of the woeful countenance. Scientific philosophy wearies for a new Cervantes who will put a stop to its paving the ways to truth by dint of argument. All opinions have a right to exist, and if we speak of privilege, then preference should be given to such as are most run down today, namely such opinions as cannot be verified and which are, for that selfsame reason, universal. Um, a little bit later he says, uh, talking about experience, have we humans got sufficient experience? Can experience give us what we want? If so, let science, let craftsmanship serve our everyday need. Let even philosophy, also eager to serve, go on finding universal truths. But is that all there is? Why, why do people do metaphysics, even if they do it badly and they, they fall into traps? Because this realm doesn't have everything we need. He says, beyond craft, or we might say technology in our day, beyond science and philosophy, there is another region of knowledge. Through all the ages, men, each one at his own risk, have sought to penetrate into this region. Shall we, men of the 20th century, or shall we, viewers of the 21st century, voluntarily renounce our supreme powers and rights, and because public opinion demands it, occupy ourselves exclusively with discovering useful information? 
or in order not to appear mean or poverty stricken in our own eyes, shall we accept in place of the philosopher's stone our modern metaphysics, which muffles her dread of actuality and postulates, absolutes, and such like apparently transcendental paraphernalia? Shestov sees an oscillation between these two things, and he says, look, you're screwed up if you think that these are the only two options. This isn't satisfying. This doesn't give us what we actually need as human beings. And the only reason why we accept this is because we're suckers who let somebody con us into thinking that this is the only way we can go. Over here, we're also suckers if we let somebody tell us that we can only think things this way, that thought must be constrained along these lines, that we have to accept this system as being, being the only explanation of things. We remain within experience, we go beyond experience, and on both sides we, we meet up with a kind of necessity that really has for its support ultimately only the, the public opinion the demand of the crowd. Now you might say, well, what about science? Science works and all that. He's talking about something more than just doing science. He's talking about science, you know, sort of a, a religious worship of science, you know, turning it into the arbiter of all truths. Something that doesn't observe any proper limits because it thinks that it can apply to everything. No real scientist actually has that point of view. Only people who don't fully understand what science is about, think that science addresses all of our human problems. Going beyond experience, how do we do it? Do we do it just with logic? Or do we use the imagination? Do we use our experience to go beyond experience and reflect upon it? These are all important things that, that uh, Shestoff is trying to bring to light. Now I want to talk about utilitarianism, morality, why he is criticizing those. I want to make it clear right from the start that, that Shestoff is not an immoralist in the sense of somebody who's advocating sort of a just reversal of, of morality and saying whatever people think to be bad, you know, let that be my good, and you know, what they consider to be good is, is, is simply bad or, or anything like that. And he's not saying, um, depart from morality, that in most cases we shouldn't actually pursue the good, or that even our, in our normal social life, we don't often have some of the right intuition, some of the right feelings, some of the right, as he would say, passions about them. He's not advocating harming our neighbor, you know, um, simply to stick it to morality or, or anything like that. But he is asking about why do we take morality in, in the full sense with all that goes along with it as being sort of an infallible guide for how we ought to act, how we ought to run our lives, how we ought to structure our wills, how we ought to give into or resist our desires. Why do we do that? He gives you a couple different possibilities. He actually says that in some respects, and here he's not just echoing Nietzsche, he's echoing a lot of moralists, a lot of people. And he's noting something <clears throat> that we can see in our own experience uh, day to day, um, depending on, on you know, how uh, good or bad of an environment we're in. For many people, morality, rules about right and wrong, notions of, of good and bad, um, making choices, praising, blaming, judgments, all those sorts of things, is an opportunity to exercise cruelty towards other people. It's a form of aggression. This is actually what gives morality a bad name. This is why Nietzsche was criticizing, you know, Rosantema. This is why, um, you know, the, the, some egoists say everything is all just self-love at the bottom. He's not going to say that all morality is based on that. But that is one of the traps that morality falls into. Another trap is of sort of chaining us within this, this ironclad, uh, unbreakable set of, of rules that really amounts to something like a logic. And it ends up 
being inflexible, it ends up doing damage to us and to, to others. Um, it ends up subjecting us. Another thing that he talks about is the fact that a lot of morality really is kind of based on self-love, selfishness. He's got this great passage. This is in uh, the second part, passage 11. It's called In Defense of Righteousness. He says, Inexperienced and ingenious people see righteousness in righteousness merely a burden which lofty people have assumed out of respect for law or for some other high and inexplicable reason. But a righteous man has not only duties, but rights. True, sometimes when the law is against him, he has, no, he has to compromise. Yet, how rarely does the law desert him? No cruelty matters in him so long as he does not infringe the statutes. Modesty forbids him to say too much, but if he were to let go, what a luxurious panegyric might he deliver to himself. Remembering his works, he praises himself at all times, not aloud but inwardly. The nature of virtue demands it. A man must rejoice in his morality and ever keep it in mind. And after that, people declare it's hard to be righteous. Whatever the other virtues may be, he says, certainly righteousness has its selfish side. As a rule, it's decidedly worthwhile to make considerable sacrifices in order later on to enjoy in calm confidence all that surety and all those rights bestowed on a man by morality and public approval. And by talking about public approval, he's steering us towards what he thinks morality ultimately does indeed depend upon, um, which is something that we, we want to, to look at. Um, he's got a lot of interesting discussions towards the end of, of section one where he's talking about, um, again, German philosophers and metaphysicians. He says, the Germans try to get at Allgemeingültigkeit, um, being valid for everybody. He says, well, if the problem of knowledge is to fathom all the depths of actual life, then experience, insofar as it repeats itself, is uninteresting. Um, it's necessary, however, to know what nobody yet knows, and therefore we must walk not on the common road of Allgemein Gutikeit, but on new tracks. And then he says, have you ever been talking about epistemology, seemingly, right? Knowledge? He says, thus morality, which lays down definite rules and thereby guards life for a time from any surprise, exists only by convention, and in the end collapses before the non-moral surging up of individual human aspirations. He, he's not saying that, that morality is nothing. He's just saying that the sphere of the moral crumbles before what it thought to encompass and, and enfold within it, but which actually doesn't completely remain within there. Laws, all of them, have only a regulating value and are necessary only to those who want rest and security. But the first and essential condition of life is lawlessness. Laws are a refreshing sleep, and we do need sleep sometimes. Lawfulness is a creative activity. That's Shostov's view. Um, he also ends up saying uh, some other useful things, um, which are going to lead us where we want to go. He says, it's clear to any impartial observer that practically every man changes his opinion ten times a day. Much has been said on this topic. Three-fourths of our education goes to teaching us most carefully to conceal within ourselves the changeableness of our moods and judgments. A man who cannot keep his word is the last of men never to be trusted. Likewise, a man with no firm convictions, it's impossible to work together with him. Morality, here as always making towards utilitarian ends, issues the eternal principle, thou shalt remain true to thy convictions. In cultured circles, this commandment is considered so unimpeachable that men are terrified even to appear inconstant in their own eyes. People become sort of inhabited and infected by the, the moral law, which is supposed to, in, in, you know, in certain respects, liberate them and, and make it possible for them to live a fully human life. But instead, what it does is it constrains them and he mentions utilitarianism. We looked at these other reasons. Morality leads to sort of a utilitarian way of looking at things. And what does a utilitarian way of looking at things depend on? The many. And what we call public 
opinion. And the many is not just an assemblage of people, it's kind of a feeling, a mood, a pressure upon the individual. Conform. See things our way. It's interesting because if you explore crowds, many's, okloi, you know, uh, in Greek, um, multitudes, sometimes you find that they're all feeling this pressure as well, this moral pressure to conform, and none of them actually buy into it. None of them actually like it. They just think that, well, everybody else expects me to behave this way, so I'd better, you know, keep up appearances and, and go on with this, and I'd better make myself the kind of person who can keep up appearances, so I'd better impose this upon myself. And then after a while, they, they forget that they put on a mask, and they think that that's their actual face. And then when they're, they're you know, exposed to somebody who doesn't see things that way, they say, you are immoral. You're not acting like the rest of us are and want you to be doing. And they, they manage to get that person quite often to internalize it as well. Um, he says one other thing that, that's quite interesting uh, about this, or in this, this vein. He says, um, oh, where is that? 116. Yeah. Um, the normative theory which has taken such hold in Germany and Russia bears that stamp of the free and easy self-assurance which characterizes the state of contentment. And he goes on and he's talking about this. Um, and then he says, not every witness will give evidence so, so honestly about, about this. It amounts to this. Philosophical research is not a search for truth but a conspiracy among people who dethrone truth and exalt instead the all-binding norm. The task is truly ethical. Morality always was and always will be utilitarian. And then he says something else. And bullying. It's a way in which the many impose upon, even if they don't truly in their hearts of hearts completely buy into it, they impose upon individuals a, a code, the need to be self-same, the need to fit into to the system. And that fits utilitarian ends quite well. I mean, it's interesting, if you read John Stuart Mill, uh, a lot of people want to read on liberty, and they say, ah, oh, he's this great libertarian. Um, read through utilitarianism and pay very close attention to uh, sections three and four, and you'll see how, in some respects, Mill is almost totalitarian. The, the proof of utilitarianism will come when everybody has become a utilitarian. Um, that's the only way you can truly demonstrate it, because it's really based on a postulate, Shestoff would say. There's no reason why you have to buy into that. There's no reason to keep you from buying into that either, for that matter. He's not saying you have to turn against morality. Just recognize that, like logic, like science, like metaphysics, it, it sets out these, these systems that are supposed to be necessities, necessary truths that we all must bow down to and restrain ourselves within, and that we're the ones who choose whether to do that or not. Um, he says a few other interesting things, specifically touching on utilitarianism, and so let's, let's actually look at uh, just a few of those, and then we'll, we'll finish up. He says, um, this is in section 43 of the second part. Um, the utilitarian point of view, he says, has no place in philosophy. What's, what's the, the, you know, what he's talking about there? He says, you know, if a patient fulfills all the orders of a doctor, we say he behaves wisely. If he neglects his treatment, we say he's stupid. If a healthy person wanted to inoculate himself with a dangerous disease, we would say he was mad. To such an extent, we're convinced that disease is evil, health good. What is our conviction based upon? How do we know that disease is actually bad? At a glance, the question seems absurd. And he says the philosopher has no right to appeal to the crowd, the many, the ordinary person on the street. The philosopher ought to open up questions like this. We have to drop the utilitarian point of view in order to really philosophize well. Common sense tells us sickness is bad. 
we need to figure that out. Rather than just saying whatever the many think is, is the case. Uh, let's look at another more uh, extensive passage. Um, here we go. This is where he's targeting John Stuart Mill. It's better to be an unhappy man than a happy pig. The utilitarians hope by this golden bridge to get over the chasm which separates them from the promised land of the ideal. But psychology stepped in and rudely interrupted. There are no unhappy people. The unhappy ones are all pigs. Dostoevsky's philosopher of the underworld, the underground man, Rashkolinov, uh, Rashkolnikov, sorry, and also Hamlet and such like, are not simply unhappy men whose fate might be esteemed or even preferred before some happy fates. They are simply unhappy swines, and they themselves are principally aware of it. This is where he says something really interesting. But first, let's dwell on that, and then we'll come back to this passage. Mill was saying, yeah, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a dunce satisfied, better to be you know, a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Because a human being is aware of you know, how, how, how elevated their faculties are. And what we find in real literature is not this idealizing. It's instead this realization that we are kind of this entire gamut I have this, this lesser side, and even my pig-like side is not happy. And I'm not all these great faculties, these great aspirations. I am the whole thing here. Mill was kind of hiding that from, from himself. What, what Shostev ends with here is, he, hath that, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. This... Uh, passage that you see in, in the Gospels over and over again. Um, the notion is we should actually see ourselves in, in that condition. That's what the underground man is actually inviting us to do in Dostoevsky. Um, he tells us in section 78, all our judgments are permeated through and through with utilitarianism. And were we to attempt to purify them from this adulteration, what would remain of modern philosophy? Um, truths are what are useful for the many to have some sort of consistency. Modern philosophy is particularly given to this, he thinks. Uh, finally, um, let's look in section 96. He says... Um, in spite of our high-flown theories, we've always been extremely practical, great utilitarians. Um, this is a constant temptation for us, Shestov thinks. There's something about the nature of human beings that makes us want to subject our, our thoughts, our experiments, our existential position to the many, to common sense. If we do that and we give in, then we will allow morality to put a complete bind on us. And it's probably in the, the last estimate going to look like utilitarianism, or it's going to look like some arbitrary code, or it's going to look like Kantianism. But in any case, it's going to be a cage from which we, we cannot get out, and which we locked ourselves into, with the help of, of other people, many of whom may feel themselves you know, completely locked in, or may not even be aware that they're part of this, this, this apparatus. Like metaphysics, logic, like science, all of these can become forms of, of idolatry, and that's what he thinks has happened in, in much of modern philosophy. That's what Shestov is criticizing in philosophy. He's not criticizing philosophy as such, he's criticizing certain forms which have become very prevalent in our culture. And he's trying to offer us a way out to show us a different path. It's not something that he could spell out entirely because were he to do so, he would be engaging in exactly the same sort of system building that he's criticizing. So that's a fit place to leave off, I think. And uh, there's still more yet to explore in this great little work.